You're listening to the Bird Dog Babe Podcast with my mom, Courtney Bastion. Like, let's say they don't they don't grab the bird or they drop mm-hmm. the bird or things like that. It could be a jaw out of alignment. Uh, mm-hmm. If you see them like shaking their head, it's like as if they're trying to pop their jaw back into their own, you know, joint. Um, if you see them hold their head low, lower than usual, it could be a shoulder out of alignment because those muscles go from the shoulder to the neck. And if, mm-hmm. and if they hold their head down, it's less painful. Their tail set can be affected. Sometimes there's some breeds that do pace and pacing could be a normal gait for them, but generally pacing is a painful gait. Hey, bird dog babes. My name is Courtney Vashon and I am obsessed with all things bird dogs. And I'm here with you to share the stories, experiences, knowledge, and opinions from the women and a few guys in the industry that are killing it. I'm a Wisconsin girl living in a Montana world. I'm mom and two incredible kiddos, wife and occasional assistant to a pro gun dog trainer, traveling the U.S. talking about canine nutrition while hunting, breeding, and competing with my German wire hair pointers and Bracco Italianos. As someone who started hunting later in life because I wanted to give my dogs the opportunity to do what they were bred to do, I'm here to help inspire, educate, and connect women to get their bird dogs out in the field and experience a bond like no other. So pour yourself a glass of wine and get ready to be challenged and encouraged while you learn. This is the Bird Dog Babe Podcast. My guest today is Jacqueline A. Doval, also known as Doc Jackie, the owner of the Texas Animal Wellness Center and the Alternative Health and Wellness Center in Central Houston. Doc Jackie is a licensed doctor of chiropractic and was the first chiropractor in Texas to be certified in animal chiropractics. The majority of her practice involves horses, dogs, cats, and people, but she has also adjusted a plethora of two- and four-legged animals. What I find pretty impressive is that she is the chiropractor for the past two years of Westminster Kennel Club Best in Show winners. Quite a few national specialty winners amongst her list of many top dogs in the country. I've personally had a full body chiropractic session with Doc Jackie and wowza, you need to experience it to believe it. All right, let's get after it. Thank you to sponsor Dakota 283 unparalleled protection for traveling to and from your favorite hunting spot. Dakota 283 kennels are a premium quality roto mold with recess handles on top for convenient and safe tie down and makes it easy to lift up into the truck. I love the secure door frame with high security locks so I know my dogs are safe when I need to stop for fuel. An added bonus is the drain hole in the back which makes cleaning a breeze when your dog has been run hard and put away wet. Head over to Dakota283.com and use promo code BIRDDOGBABE for a 10% discount. Thanks to sponsor Excel Shooting Sports, elite dealer of Cesar Guarini, Fab Arm, and Siren Shotguns. Siren is the world's only full line of shotguns created for the female competitor, hunter, and shotgun enthusiast. Excel is one of only four demo centers west of the Mississippi. They give you the opportunity to actually try out a gun before you walk out the door with it. As an elite dealer for Cesar Guarini, Excel offers their customers unlimited pit stops of free service and tune-ups on all shotguns, a great way to have your gun in top condition for the upcoming hunting or target season. In addition, they're offering an exclusive deal to all of the Bird Dog Babe listeners for a free gun slip with each purchase, a $90 value. All right. Today we are talking with Doc Jackie. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic, Courtney. Thank you so much for having me on. This is exciting. I'm so excited to have you and you are having a gorgeous day in Texas. Yes. Nice blue skies. The temperature is probably like 81. Absolutely. And, and your beautiful uh, poolside view was amazing. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, I wanted to hop into telling our listeners about who you are and what you do. Well, that is awesome. Uh, do you want me to start first? Yes. Because usually they tell me I know who I am. But anyway, I love what <laughs> I do. 
I'm, I'm, they know me, a lot of my clients know me as Doc Jackie, my friends do too. Um, and who I am, I am a, a human and animal chiropractor here in the state of Texas. Uh, for humans, I'm known as Dr. Duvall. And then I do my Wonder Woman turn and I become Doc Jackie when it comes to animals. Because, you know, of course, there's uh, legal aspects to all this in, in Texas. Um, in the doctor chiropractic uh, license is for humans and the Doc Jackie is for animals. So that's cool. Uh, certified. I'm the first animal chiropractor in the state of Texas who is certified in animal chiropractic. All right, let me put it this way. I'm the first chiropractor in the state of Texas who's certified as an animal chiropractor. And I hold both the basic certification and the advanced certification from the American Veterinary Chiropractic Association. Wow. Yeah. So that's Very pretty cool. cool. Yes. Yeah. And you just recently, did you get an award or recognition I saw? Yes, I sure did. That was a, a total surprise. Uh, I got a Lifetime Achievement Award and I was inducted into the Animal Chiropractic Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. I had, um, yeah, I guess probably because of all the things that I, I've been really pro animal chiropractic and pro alternative therapies for animals. And I've done a lot of, I guess I've been the Joan of Arc, if you will, here in Texas, you know, when, when people, when, you know, certain boards decide to come after people and usually it's me because I'm the most visible one. But um, when they realize that, yes, I'm certified and yes, I know what I'm talking about. And yes, I follow the law. Then we're, we're, we're on good terms. See, <laughs> it's always a good thing. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so I first met you um, actually this past October at the Golden Retriever National, which was held in California. And uh, you stopped at our Purina booth and you are you're just an amazing person. Your enthusiasm, your passion all the things. You're oh, so good. You. you bring such a light just to everything you do. And, and I had gone down to um, Texas in December and worked at uh, a show down there. Um, where was it? Dallas. I believe it's Dallas? Dallas. Yes. Dallas. Yes. And um, you had a full schedule of dogs that you were working at at that show. And you were able to fit me into your tight schedule and I had a full adjustment from you and it was absolutely amazing. You know, yes. the, 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 I, I honestly love what I do. You know, there's sadly some, some people, ex, their ex, first experience with chiropractic is with an automobile accident or some work comp injury. And, and that saddens me because ideally the um, practice of chiropractic should be, it's a drug free, right? It's drug free. Mm -hmm. And what we do as, as chiropractors is we basically, uh, after adjusting, for example, the spine, right? If there's some sort of interference that's, that's blocking the nerve flow from the brain to the spine, to the organ that it's supposed to work on or the muscles that it's supposed to work on, when I'm able to go ahead and, and adjust that spine or that wrist or that ankle or whatever, and suddenly all that disappears, that's a mm -hmm. pretty cool feeling. What I try to explain to people is it's like, you know, the hose, you turn the water on, of course, the water will travel through the hose and go to the garden and the flowers will bloom, right? Ideally water and, and all that good stuff. But if you take a bicycle, for example, and you block that flow just a little bit, yes, you still have flow going, but not the same quality. Mm -hmm. And so it's not like the garden's not going to flourish. It will, but then how much of it will flourish. And so that's where, where I come in. That's, you right. know, I just feel like I help the body help itself. Mm -hmm. And you're, are you recommending more? Um, so you had said a lot of people come in after the car accident. So you're recommending more of a preventative care. Exactly. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. you know, and it's, on, ongoing. Yes. I mean, if you think about it, you know, how traumatic is it to be born? You know, you see those forceps coming out, here comes the baby's head, you know, and they're mm -hmm. twerking everything. And, uh, and, you know, then you have your two-year-old uh, temper tantrum and they throw themselves on the floor and they're hit the hair on the floor. And I mean, this is when it all began. Mm. basically when it all begins. I, I adjusted my son at three hours of birth uh, you know, because I was determined that he was going to have his head on right uh, for the rest of his life. And then at 16, I was about to take him out. But <laughs> I think parents <laughs> can probably relate to that a little bit, but no, yeah. he's still doing great. Yeah. And, and actually my son, he was going um, ever since he was about two weeks old. Oh, wow. um, yeah, it's amazing. And they, they, he, my chiropractor actually took several pictures of them and put them on social media because of just how happy and natural they are during the adjustment. Absolutely. You know, my son, yeah. it, it's, it's amazing when he was probably even like 
two years old, he'd go, mommy, I need adjustment. I mean, how does a kid know? And you know, it's like I would, he would come to me and say, I need an adjustment. And so he would lie down on my table and I'd adjust him, mm-hmm. you know? It's pretty yeah. neat that there's no, um, and, and the same like with animals in a way, right? There's no placebo, mm-hmm. right? How does the child know that, oh, had he taken uh, Tylenol, for example, it would have been better than an adjustment or something like that, right. you know? Right. So same thing with the animals, you know, they, they don't know, but when they, their response is quite positive, then you go, hmm, there's probably something to this. Yep, yep. And what kind of animals are you all working on? Oh, I just, well, you know, this is what I tell people. I just, horses, dogs, cats, people who don't kick or bite, and some jackasses. <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. <laughs> Which is all true about yeah. the human and uh, animal. But I've had the uh, privilege of adjusting even like a zebra, ferrets, oh, uh, lemurs. I had, I, I had saved one lemur from having an amputation, which was a pretty cool thing. Oh, um, no. Yes. I'm, I, you know, I almost had the opportunity to adjust the tiger's wrist, but sadly that didn't happen. And it has nothing to do with the Tiger King, I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> that, wouldn't that be an experience, though, oh, if you had been <laughs> Right. Oh so my god. Good. So good. Way. Oh my. Yeah. So <laughs> it's been it's been fun. I've I've really enjoyed uh you know what I my this time. It's been awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I've been practicing it's- since nineteen ninety two. And, uh, and, and going to what you were saying that, that you had an adjustment like no other. I'm gonna mm-hmm. go back to that just for a second and, and say the reason why I feel like I'm different and it's not tuning my own horn, actually what I'm doing is telling you that this is the way it's supposed to be mm-hmm. as chiropractors we're taught to adjust from head to toe however there's some who are yes in the art of healing but sadly there are some that are in the business of healing mm-hmm. and i feel like i personally am in the art of healing and yes you won't see 40 people in my waiting area you'll see one at a time because i like to make sure that i give quality care you know, there's no way that I can give you quality care by 40 people outside waiting on me, mm-hmm. you know? So that's, yeah. I feel like it's the difference and people go, well, you know, you should just be able to adjust the Atlas or just the spine and it should take care of the rest. And I'm like, okay, so you stub your toe. If I adjust your neck, is that going to fix your toe? Mm-hmm. I don't think so. And then you're going to start walking differently, which will then affect your ankle, which will affect your knee, which will affect your hip, which will affect your back, you know? And so it, it's, everything is connected. And so uh, when people tell me, well, you know, I told the doctor just to just, you know, that I had neck pain and all he did was adjust my neck. And I'm like, was your neck attached to anything? <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, because the muscles are all there, right? We're attached to something. So yes, I adjust elbows, wrists, shoulders, toes, fingers, ankles, you name it. And all jaws. And the ears. Yeah, and jaws. Yes. And the ears. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, yeah. And, and really, you are the first chiropractor that has ever um, touched my wrists or ankles or feet. Uh, yes, jaw and ears too, but, uh, which is amazing. So, yeah. so now I and guess, you, you know, maybe about your wrist. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Cause I'm it's, sorry. it's, yeah, it saved me. Um, I was about ready to go in to have carpal tunnel surgery. Um, so it, it's saved me from having to do that. Now I know that I can just maintain the pain I have by having those adjustments. Isn't that awesome? Can you imagine? So had you had, I mean, every, you know, what is it? Uh, individual results may vary, right? It's right. Not, practice not for everybody, just like certain, you know, surgery procedures are not for everybody either, or medications for that matter. But, you know, the fact that you're, so what I try to explain to people, especially when it comes to carpal tunnel, for example, you know, you have nine little bones in that wrist. And it's like a puzzle, you know, each bone has its place. It has where it's supposed to fit, but sometimes bit by trauma, bit due to swelling or inflammation, sometimes that, that ligament around the wrist can expand and bones will move and muscles move bones. So sometimes like even like, right, if you just suddenly contract that, that, that muscle will move a bone and sometimes it can move it out of alignment. Well, if I am standing like three feet away from you, you feel quite comfortable, right? Mm -hmm. But if I come closer to you and stand right close to you, but I'm not touching, you feel that pressure. And it's similar to what happens in the wrist. 
it doesn't mean you have to have something pinched because that's what people usually think of chiropractors release the pinch off of a nerve kind of thing or whatever's on pinching a nerve. And it doesn't even have to be a pinch. It could just be increased pressure because if I, if that bone is shifted, then you have the arteries, the veins, uh, the nerves, the lymphatics and other little soft tissues that also now are getting compromised. And so as that keeps building up, the swelling builds up. And so it's like a blood pressure cuff over that nerve and over those arteries and veins. And then suddenly that pain, because it'll, the, body will, the body will start telling the brain, you know what, we have a problem in that wrist and it is painful and we're not getting the, the signals down there. And so the sensory portion is, I feel pain, I feel heat, I feel, right? Mm -hmm. And then the motor portion is, I'm not gonna move it because it hurts. And so just like if you have a sponge that you have water in it, and of course when you squeeze it, it moves and you get the water out. But if all of a sudden you don't do that and it becomes stagnant, it's not working properly and it doesn't smell good, mm -hmm. right? So same thing, if then that, that added thing about if you don't use it, you lose it, that's right. pretty much, that's pretty same true. Because thing. yeah. things start breaking down and then they go, well, you know, not so, do I need an adjustment? Does everybody need an adjustment? I'm like, well, you know, of course you're talking to the chiropractor. Yes, but <laughs> I would say, well, look at your car, for example, it's maintenance, right? If you don't have to align your wheels in your car, but if you don't, then little by little, all that little movement, odd movements here and there will start rubbing everything the wrong way. And then you have quick, quick, the deterioration is quicker. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Makes sense. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, so I met you at, at the national and then you're at the all breed show. So you are very well known in the canine competitive world you have uh, a pretty amazing client base and I know some of the dogs that you adjusted from Westminster. So tell us a little bit about that. Tell us about really how well known you are in this industry and, and the difference you're making in, in these top dogs. You know, in Texas, we're just, I'm, you know, it's like as if I struck gold, but here in Texas, we have several of the top, uh, uh, dog handlers in the world and they're, they're in Texas, either Dallas, Houston area. And my practice is here in the Houston area, but I do travel. I do have a mobile practice. And um, we also have here in Houston what's called the World Series of Dog Shows. So it's like the Westminster of the South in a way, in the, uh, the very South, not the Southeast, because that's, of course, would be the other one in Orlando. But, um, but by being here and having the opportunity of working that show as, a, as an animal chiropractor, I've met quite a few of the top dog handlers. And um, lucky me, uh, they've seen the results of, you know, the, the kind of work that I do. And of course, you know, in the confirmation world, movement also is everything besides the fact that they meet the breed standards, of course. But mm -hmm. you want to see, that's sometimes like that one second kind of thing or the millisecond thing is like if they're not walking properly and the and the judge is a movement judge that one won't win mm -hmm. and so when I'm able to help those dogs out and uh, it's a pretty neat thing and yes lucky me there there are a lot of the west for two years in a row the um winner and the reserve champion are have been my clients of Westminster of Westminster yes wow yes and and several of the other group winners as well, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I'm very, mm -hmm. I'm very lucky. Out of the seven last, the year before last, uh, three of them were my clients, and out of this one, five of them were my clients. Mm. Very cool. That, yeah, that's that's a very cool fact right there, because yes. there's <laughs> there's some definitely something to that. And so, what can what can people expect to see? in the difference of their dogs. Um, and I say that based on, I had a dog that we were campaigning in field trials and I would often take him to shows maybe once a month during that hard training and competition regime. And I would notice him get a little bit roachy over the loin and after his adjustment would be evened out and moving very clean. So tell exactly. me about the, the physiologics of that. Okay, that very good question. You know, so first of all, some people go, well, how does my dog get out of alignment? Well, you know, mm -hmm. if, you know, sometimes it could be, especially if they're in hunting in the field, 
you know, there's the terrain sometimes can be quite rough. It could be rocky. There could be divots and things like that, that they could get their toes caught up on and or tumble. And, you know, sometimes they're just so focused on what they're, they're so bred to do, which is get after that bird kind of thing that they Mm -hmm. don't see what's in front of them. And uh, sometimes they've even hit trees, you know? Um, So naturally in be it a dog or a horse, about 60 to 70 percent of their weight is up front so if they injure their like wrist or their shoulder for example then they're going to shift their weight and compensate right they're they're four-legged beings so if the right front is out usually what they'll do is they'll go ahead and transfer the weight to the diagonal rear so it's right front left hind and then sometimes what you'll see is if both shoulders are out then they'll try to roach right? And try to get the Mm -hmm. weight off of the front end, trying to shift Mm -hmm. and compensate in the back end. So that's where movement gets compromised. And, and for hunting dogs, you know, it could be the endurance that could affect endurance because naturally they're going to have that adrenaline going, but then eventually the pain will kick in and it'll Mm -hmm. start stopping that stamina and the endurance. And so having the dog adjusted pain-free, you know, if there's something that I can do to, to minimize, you know, the pain or, you know, that cycle, then they can function better and move better. Right. And what would be a sign? So for, for somebody that might not know what um, a, a, the dog looks like at the best of its movement, what are some signs I could see knowing if my dog would be able to improve with an adjustment? That's a good question. Sometimes, for example, let's say if it's a jaw thing, like let's say they don't, they don't grab the bird or they drop mm-hmm. the bird or things like that. It could be a jaw out of alignment. Uh, mm-hmm. If you see them like shaking their head, it's like as if they're trying to pop their jaw back into their own you know, joint. Um, if you see them hold their head low, lower than usual, it could be a shoulder out of alignment because those muscles go from the shoulder to the neck. And, mm-hmm. if, and if they hold their head down, it's less painful. Their tail set, can be affected. Sometimes there's some breeds that do pace and pacing could be a normal gait for them, but generally pacing is a painful gait. So, and pacing means, for example, I, you know, just for those that don't know about movement in that sense is the right front and the right hind work together in unison, just like a giraffe, believe it or not. Giraffes are always pacing. So that's not a comfortable movement. Yes. And so the other thing is, if you notice that there's a hitch, you know, like sometimes if they do a little skip or um, if the tail set, like if they only wag their tail to the right, if you look at their body and when they come to you, you know, you call your dog, Hey, come here. And they come to you like crabbing or like a Mm -hmm. bent frame. That means that they could be compensating for ribs out of alignment or their Mm -hmm. sternum. So these are all factors that affect movement in dogs and, you know, dogs are athletes. So why would you have a superb, athlete going to a chiropractor and not your dog. Yeah. Right. And right. and so you had said with the pacing and I've even noticed um some like the bunny hopping being corrected yes. into a dog that will then stride out after it's had that adjustment. Exactly. You know, mm-hmm. barring that it's not like a luxating patella that they're trying to pop in. Yeah, there's there's right. other things that can contribute to things like that, but if that's not the case then most likely it could be a matter of just getting the dog adjusted. How often are you recommending adjustments for yeah, a dog that is actively on, on the trial circuit or it's hunting season and they're going um, either every weekend or several days a week? How, how often do you think that that would be important for them to have it done during their heavy competition hunting times? That's, that's a very good question because first of all, you want to always make sure that your dog is in great conditioning. And, and even though they're just for hunting kind of thing, um, you always want to warm them up just like you would any athlete. And some people forget that sometimes they go from the, from the back of the truck, let's go, you know, instead Mm -hmm. of warming them up. And, you know, that's how you reduce injuries like that. If you, if you really stretch your dog out and warm them up, um, I, I would, you know, it depends on what, what the competition is like, right? And, and what the mm-hmm. owner wants to accomplish. Sometimes people just go for the fun and some people really want to win. And, um, and if you want to win, you've got to do what the winners do. And usually after competition, they'll come and get their dogs adjusted. 
because they want to make sure they're good for the next one and make sure absolutely there's no injury, uh, you know, or what else can they do at home? Like, let's say if they're in a different state and they can't come and get their dog adjusted, I would teach them things to do, not that how to adjust their dog, but things to do to help them carry them over till they can come back and see me again. So be okay. it muscle work, be it stretching, massage, things like that. So you're recommending more that they have the adjustment done after the the competition or at right after a hard hunt versus right before? I would suggest before and then after, quite honestly. Okay. You know, okay. Um, so if it were like your your regular pets, let's say if it's your regular pet, um, they, I see them today, for example, then I would tell them, okay, let, let me see you back in a week. Let's see what your body holds and doesn't hold. And then after that, if your dog is fine, then once a month. However, if it's an injury, you know, that would probably change the treatment protocol. It all depends on what, what all's going on with the dog. But I have dogs that not only like you, like you, right? Your dog does hunting, but also does confirmation. Well, mm -hmm. you know, I have dogs that do confirmation, dock diving, agility, and fly eyeball, you know, very high impact type stuff. And they could be hunting dogs or sheep uh, dog herding, you know, herding dogs kind of thing. So they come more often. They would come more often because the dynamic and the injury could be different. And those are the things that, you know, that I would address in terms of like nail trimming, grooming, conditioning, weight, and of course, nutrition. Nutrition is mm -hmm. huge. Right. Um, how long will that adjustment last then? Is, are, are you saying that that would be depend on the dog and where they're at with conditioning? Yes, I would say okay. that it's, it would be dependent on that. Now, I'll, for example, I'll tell you like Shelties, for example, that tend to be a little bit straighter in the front. More, mm -hmm. more, more often than not, they tend to have shoulders out of alignment. Golden Retrievers, more often than not, their wrists, they tend to be very pouncy kind of dogs. Mm -hmm. uh, border Collies, hips and, and hip flexors, their muscles, those are really, really important. And, you know, how they go down, you know, they, they're low to the ground and drive. Uh, when it comes to agility, I'm looking at ribs, especially when they go through the weave poles, because, right, equal and opposite force. So if, as, a, as, for example, you've probably seen border collies just tear through those, through those weave poles. And the same way they move one out of the way to get to the other, that weave pole comes back and hits them. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And in fly ball, when they pounce on that, on that box, sometimes their momentum is so much so that they even slam their face into the box it's so quick you don't see it, but if you slow motion that video, you'll see them just smashing into that, grabbing the ball, ball as it pops out, turning around, pushing off, and then go jump, jump, jump with a ball in their mouth. Because yeah. they run down without a ball, right, going over these mm -hmm. jumps, slam into the box, grab a ball, then push off, jump back, and then they're jumping back with a ball full speed in their mouth. So, so I tell mm -hmm. people, why don't you put an apple in your mouth and start running, <laughs> and yeah. you'll see the difference. <laughs> right. And it, it's just, it's that impact of it even dropping the tailgate, let the dog jump out to go hunting. It's that impact yes. on that front. Yes. And so, because, mm -hmm. and that's what I try to explain to people. Okay. So let's, let's look at that. Let's look at if I, if I'm a dog and I'm going to jump off the tail, you know, from, from the back of the, of the pickup truck, I'm going head first. Mm -hmm. My hands are down and I'm going head first to the ground. Now, depending on the angle, right, if I go more forward or if I go straight down, if I have to go straight down, the impact is going to be greater. And I'm going to smack, I'm going to pull my head up high so I don't smack my jaw on the ground. That's a whiplash. Mm -hmm. So I truly, truly recommend people not to let their dogs jump out of pickup trucks and ideally help them back into the pickup truck because that's a great chance for an injury. What if there was a little bit of dew on the ground and as the dog jumps down, he slips, he or she slips. Mm -hmm. You've lost your you, you've lost your performance dog. It could right. be just as simple as that. That quick, the perfect storm. It, yep. And it could end your hunt before it even starts. Just jumping out. Exactly. Exactly. Right. As something as simple as that. It happens to humans. Why wouldn't it happen mm -hmm. to a dog? Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. What is what can we expect um, having a session with you with the dog? Uh, how long does it take? And what are you all going to be going over? with that with them that's a, that's a very good question so the, the first of all what happens is somebody will will go online for example and, and set up their appointment online and mm -hmm. when they do that they'll see that in texas that it's required that the veterinarian author authorize 
the, uh, the uh, chiropractic care. So they would have to download a form and take it to their veterinarian and the veterinarian has to examine the dog and determine that the chiropractic adjustment will do no harm. That I find quite interesting because not all veterinarians mm -hmm. know what chiropractic is all about and what it is that I do, but they get to supervise. So we get the general supervision, the permission, and they come to my office. And when they come to my office, you know, of course, I, I'm the one that's greeting them. Nobody else. It's all one on one. And uh, I take a history. And from the history, then I go ahead and observe their gait. And from their gait, then we go ahead and I talk about what it is that I see. I'll have them walk the dog for me, for, me, for example, uh, back and forth. We'll do a slow walk. Then we'll do a faster walk. Then we'll do more of a gait. And then we come back. And then sometimes I'll film them so that they could see for themselves. And or I'll go ahead and demonstrate. I'll go ahead and hold on to the dog and, and walk and trot them too so that they could see what it is that I'm seeing. And so then after that, we go ahead and I take them into the office and we go ahead and either get them on the table or work it with them on the ground, depending on how big the dog is. And depending if the dog is used to being handled or not, or is, you know, fear bite or whatever, we may or may not use what I call the party mask, which is a muzzle, um, no <laughs> sedation. There's no sedation whatsoever because I'm okay. not a veterinarian, so I cannot sedate. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Not only that, but if you're under sedation, how can they tell me it hurts more than it does? Mm -hmm. You know, I have to have some sort of feedback, you know, and, and, I, and I'll tell people sometimes a dog will cry because that's their way of communicating or they'll bark or they'll growl or, you know, because if I'm over them, it's a very dominant position. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so I explain all these things. Uh, and also um, then I will adjust and I'll explain what it is that I'm adjusting. And sometimes I'll hear what the, the famous pop or not pop or the crack or not crack. And, um, and it's not that you have to hear a crack or a pop in order to determine that the, that the, um, adjustment happened or not it's that's just increased pressure in the joint and it releases a gas and sometimes you hear it sometimes you don't okay. um and um from there you know it could take it all depends you know like i have dogs that come in paralyzed you know oh. that visit would take a lot longer because then i'll teach them how to you know care for their dog at home you know or if it's a, a very well-conditioned dog it could take anywhere between you know usually the initial is an hour and uh, thereafter, depending on how the conditioning, it could be a quick 10 to 15 minute visit after that. Okay. Mm -hmm. What can we expect the dog is going to be like after the, after the treatment? Is it going to be sore? Is it going to be stiff? Or is it just going to run out there happy and free and feeling amazing? <laughs> And that's a very good, you know, sometimes let's say if it's a little bit of an injury, for example, I tell the people, the good thing is your dog's going to get better. The bad thing is your dog is going to get better because in my profession, this is the beauty of it. When a dog is sick, the whole family's sick, right? Because everybody wants that dog to be better. They want their dog back. So when the dog gets better, everybody's like, oh, yay. Now you can go do the things that you used to do. And you're like, no. I try to describe to people, it's like having a cut on a knuckle. Yes, that'll eventually scab over. But if you keep bending that knuckle, it's going to crack right back open. So what I want to do is... After the adjustment, keep the dog calm, right? Because they're going to feel better. And they're going to want to do the thing about jumping back on the bed and things like that. But I don't want them to. I want them to just chill. So it, you'll probably notice, one, could they be a little bit more sore? Yes. Because if things have been out of alignment for a while, muscles can shorten, ligaments can shorten, muscles can lengthen, and same thing, right? So when you put things back into alignment, it's like brace. It's instant braces. And if anybody's had orthodontic braces, and had them tighten it, tightened. Sometimes it's not that painful, but it's like having an immediate teeth in alignment kind of thing, you know, very slowly, slowly, slowly. Um, so some will feel better. Some might feel a little sore, but that too shall pass. Right? Um, and the other thing you'll notice is that sometimes they tend to sleep more. Okay. Horses will, horses, for example, will drink water immediately and they'll go and roll. It's like they hmm. do their own little rolling adjustment which is i find that quite fascinating right. and dogs will go and drink water and then just chill huh. mm -hmm. is there is there ever an instance where this might not be for every animal that it could um make them worse or take them out of alignment is that a, even a possibility you know you know, everything is possible, right? Uh, and, okay. and that would be anybody's worst nightmare, right? That we've never right. Both do no harm, right? There's an increase of, in, of likelihood of injury if the person's not trained. That's right. where I find the problem. You know, when you, you know, like everybody goes, oh, I can pop a knuckle. Well, yeah, 
you know, I could pull a tooth with a dental floss, but it doesn't make me a dentist. You right. know, you really have to know, people don't realize there's an angle to these joints and there's a, a direction where the adjustment has to happen. And if you don't know that you could cause more harm than good. And mm -hmm. so, you know, sometimes, for example, I have discovered where, you know, cause I could be the second pair of eyes on a dog for a veterinarian. And this is where we come and work together because my, my profession is not a substitution for veterinary care by no stretch of the imagination. I feel like I work in concert with them and they work in concert with me. So like, for example, this one dog had um, rip cage pain, right? Had gone to the vet, all that good stuff came to me. And this is a dog that I've been adjusting for years. And it was a, it was a um, Rottweiler. And when I went to adjust the rib, she started growling at me. And I'm like, hmm. this Harley never growls at me. This is this, there's something wrong to discover that she had osteosarcoma. Oh, wow. what that that rib had overnight just blown up and so of course the owner was upset thinking you know my vet missed this and mm -hmm. it's like no sometimes things do pop up like that overnight right. so lucky for me instead of going there and trying to adjust that because I could have broken a rib if had I not known what I was doing then that would have been something that the vet needed to know immediately and so I told her you need to go back to the vet and sadly that's what it was I had a suspicion that it was, I cannot diagnose mm -hmm. that right. kind of thing because I'm not a veterinarian, but mm -hmm. I can say, it seems like this is very serious and you might want to go to your vet. So oh. that's where a trained professional knows what to do. And so you avoid the likelihood of injury that way. Right. Is there anything mm -hmm. that the dog owner can be doing at home in between sessions um, to help strengthening, to help make that alignment last any longer? Absolutely. Follow instructions. <laughs> okay. Be like stay home for the coronavirus, then stay home. There's a reason, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. So, um, but it's one of those things. I, I try once, once they come to my office, I try to give them homework, you know, try to avoid jumping, no rough housing with other dogs immediately. Let this settle, let this okay. settle because the, the body will react and inflame and you have to give the body a chance to to get that inflammation out and sort of kind of cement things back to where they're supposed to be. Cause the, the body's very intelligent, you know, and the nervous system is so sensitive. It's like, I try to explain to people, you know, have you ever like jumped up and like washed your hand over, like brushed your hand over your, your arm and scared thinking that it was a spider and what you mm -hmm. found out it was a hair. How much does a hair weigh? Right. Right. And so I find that interesting that that's how sensitive our nervous system is. So if we are able just to give it a chance to heal, the body can take care of it. You know, our heart is beating without us telling it to beat. You know, our guts are moving without telling the gut move. So there is an, an, what we call an innate intelligence in the body and it knows how to take care of itself. And so what I would do is teach people, first of all, let the dog rest. Second, this is the kind of stretches and exercises that, we, that I would recommend and I would demonstrate. And then also I would make sure that I do a follow-up and make sure that there, you know, are there any questions? Because sometimes you get fed so much information in one visit and it's a little bit overwhelming that sometimes we just hear what we want to hear or we didn't hear what was very, very important. So that's why I try to always mm -hmm. have a follow-up in one week just to make sure we're all on the same page for the dog. Right. And tell them to take notes. <laughs> yes. And sometimes I do, right? Sometimes yeah. they videotape it, which I love because they get to see it on the video. But, you know, when you have a dog that's paralyzed, you can imagine that suddenly they blew a disc and now they can't use, they can't use the hind legs. And the hind legs look like, you know, I, I, I liken it to the um, Kermit the Frog kind of sit, right? And because they, they can't use their legs. And then suddenly we're able to get them back. And then they're in a the little wheelchair, but then they get out of the wheelchair and now they're walking. I have so many stories like that. It's just, I mean, hmm. since 1992, there's a lot of stories <laughs> <laughs> so that just the Kermit the Frog thing that just brings up something a lot of dogs that do that laying down position where we call it the frogged out in the rear yeah is yeah is you know sometimes you hear oh if they do that they one one says they have tight hips the other one says they have dysplastic hips so can you help us demyth that one way or the other yeah you know so the only way you can really know about dysplastic is through an array Mm -hmm. you can suspect dysplastic hips depending on how they do a sit but if they you know and the sit usually looks like a puppy sit so are they sitting like that because they're a puppy or is it a puppy with hip dysplasia or is it an older dog with hip dysplasia is it mm -hmm. arthritis are they compensating see so there's many things like that and line with their legs in the back 
It could just be that their tummy is hot and they're just wanting a cool floor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It could be yeah. anything. Yeah. <laughs> And what about dogs that like to sit on one hip with the other leg out? Is that just laziness? Yes. Is that just comfortability? Or is there any uh, thing there that could be a possible questioning? Well, you know, that's, that's a very good question too, because it could be laziness. It could be mm-hmm. that puppy sit, right? Or mm-hmm. if they're holding that leg out, is it that the knee, there's something in that stifle that they're worried about that they said, you know, if I hold my leg like this, it doesn't hurt. You know, we find a way to sit or we find a way to walk where it doesn't hurt. And mm-hmm. sometimes people don't even realize that they're slumped over or they're doing this. And I'm like, do you realize you do this? And I'm like, no. And I'm, so when you straighten them up, you go, they go, well, that doesn't feel comfortable. Well, there's mm-hmm. a reason then why your body's compensating. So the body will always find a way not to be in pain. The problem with that is that kind of compensation can be harmful in the long run for a lot of other joints in the body. Hmm. Okay. So a lot of us that have the bird dogs um, also compete in field trial events where we're on horseback. Oh, and cool. yeah, very cool. There's, I mean, what a great combination of horses and dogs together. So by the way, these are some events that you should be coming to because <laughs> how great, would, how great would it be to have somebody there that could adjust the dog, the horse and the, right, the hunter. Exactly. Yeah. So here the human is with a gun on a horse. And of course the horse, of course the horse, that was a good one. Um, <laughs> you know, if you, have, you have to have a bulletproof horse, basically. <clears throat> That's not mm-hmm. going to get afraid of the shotgun noise, right? Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, those guns sometimes have a kickback, right, on their mm-hmm. shoulder. And so, or if the horse moves and it's a, you know, and, and jumps down off of, let's say, a rock of some sort or whatever, or has to go down a hill and it really jars the human's back so you have to watch out in the human not only for the micro whiplashes from all from the kickback from the from the shotgun but Mm -hmm. also from the movement of the horse you know how you're moving the horse and if you are in a field trial and you're just dealing with your dog on a leash to get somewhere uh, like lure coursing for example you've seen probably dogs that are so excited about lure coursing that they're dragging the owner to the field right Mm -hmm. and that's whiplashes for the human too so you know, everybody needs to be worked on. And, and I feel like, and, and, and this is why I tell people, if you want to see what the winners are doing, you might want to do what the winners are doing. Why is it that right. they're winning? They go to chiropractors, they go to acupuncturists, they get their dogs massaged, they get, you know, they take care of themselves. Because if the human's not good, it's going to be hard. Like, let's say if the human has a uh, stiff neck from, mm. let's say one, you know, they turn their neck wrong and here goes that gun. It's going to be hard to really be accurate with a gun if you're ne- if you have a stiff neck and you're, mm-hmm. and sometimes your dog follows your body movement or where your eyes go or where your shoulders go, particularly in agility, for example, dogs really follow the shoulders. And if your neck is stiff and you have to move your whole body, your dog has just gone off course. Right. You know? right. So it can make a difference. And, it, yeah. And even as a woman in the field, you know, our upper body strength isn't always, um, I mean, statistically it's not as, it's, hard much as a man's and so when we're carrying a gun all day and a gun that's uh i think there's very few companies that make a gun that's especially fit for a woman or that has a lighter weight so a lot of times we're out uh, looking to purchase guns that are the lightest on the market but that's something if we're going on an all-day hunt or several days in a row it's wearing on our shoulder and I know exactly. I walked out of the field after the first day um, thinking, oh, I'm going to feel this tomorrow. <laughs> and, yes. uh, you know, but so, so that would, all of that would be good for just a woman hunting in general to be able to seek out some chiropractic care. Absolutely. And, you know, and also it's going to be really, really important. Again, just like you wouldn't take, ideally, you would not take your dog out of a crate and go do agility immediately. You'd warm mm-hmm. them up. By the same token, the human has to take care of themselves, you know, stretch, you know, warm up, make sure you're not cold, you know, that, that way you reduce that fatigue, you mm-hmm. increase your endurance, your stamina, and you reduce the chances of injury. That's important. You know, so 
going towards that ideal body weight, going towards, you know, let's go ahead and, and strengthen our upper body, especially as women, you are right. We generally tend to be weaker in our upper body than our, than our lower body. So I agree. Definitely. Mm-hmm. Even exercising the fingers, believe it or not. Right. Oh. So yeah. what kind of finger exercises would that be? <laughs> So, for example, and that's a good question. So, what I hard to show me over audio, but (laughs) but you can visualize this. So, if you look at your thumb, you take your thumb, and the you and you take your index finger and just sort of kind of act like you're pinching. Okay. Like if you're going to do that pinching motion or the okay motion, like put the okay sign. So, Mm -hmm. really push against that. That's resistance, and so you do that to the index finger, the middle finger. So you're pushing with your thumb. You're pushing up against that index finger you're pushing up against the middle finger you're pushing up against the ring finger you're pushing up against the pinky and the pinky believe it or not is tends to be weaker it tends to buckle you mm-hmm. know so you really want to start strengthening that you know um the other thing i try to tell people is you know make if you curl your fingers like a fern right a fern and make, create a tight tight fist and then just explode open it boom like okay. a surprise you know, like a firecracker or something. And, you know, and and just do that. You know, you want to exercise your fingers because as we get older, yes, we do get arthritic changes in our hands and our, and our knuckles and things like that. But if you can keep your hands strong, that will help reduce um, a lot of those arthritic changes. Mm -hmm. Because arthritis Um, is a joint, right? So arthritis, arthro is, it means the joint. Itis means inflammation of the joint. So the question is, how do we reduce inflammation of a joint? Well, that means you do it by avoiding things that are going to injure it or irritate it. So if your muscles are working properly, then your joint will work properly. So it's really, really important to reduce the chances of arthritis by making sure that you are in condition. Okay. Mm-hmm. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to double time my trigger finger now, thanks to you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing trigger finger exercises with my thumb right now. (laughs) That's right. There you go. And then if you get that wrist adjusted, you're going to make sure that that gun is in perfect alignment. I promise you. (laughs) I can't wait till I see you next time for another one. Hopefully we get our, our schedules back on task here. Uh, Right. I sure hope so. I'm dying to get back like everybody else. I'm sure. I bet. Tell us about how um, some of your work is with horses. How do you, do you sit on the horse? Do you have a something you stand <laughs> on? How are you doing that with some of these? Because right. I've, you have worked on, well, large horses. Is, are they Clydesdales? I don't know. I, I guess I didn't look that. Yes, I've worked on, okay. I've worked on everything from a Clydesdale to a, a dwarf. Um, so I am five foot three. And so it's, that would be considered a little bit on the short side or height challenged, if you will. <laughs> and um, th- that's what a lot of people ask, right? It's like, do you, lie, do you stand on the horse? Do you lie down, you know, do you lie him down on the table? And the answer is no. Okay. So, um, I, so what I do is it depends on what's going on, right? So the neck, I can, all that I can adjust real easy because I adjust from head to toe again and all the way down to the tail. But when it comes to a 17 hand horse, for example, well, that horse is pretty tall compared to me. At times, depends, I will have to get either on a, a mounting block and or even a picnic table. When I go to adjust the horses at the Houston Mountain Patrol, I've adjusted their dogs. Now. I mean, they're, not their dogs, their horses for about 19, 20 years now. It was real funny because when I was invited to come over and work on one of their horses, they looked at this tall horse, a Frisian, which is about 17 hands, and then they look down at me at five foot three and they go like, right, you are going to fix this horse. <laughs> uh-huh. and, you know, we're talking about a male dominated world in that profession, right? And mm-hmm. so I, I go ahead and do my thing. I observe the, the horse gait and come back, back and forth, back and forth. And then I started adjusting that horse. And when they saw the difference, they were like, okay. You know, it's almost like you hear, you can hear them under their breath going, there is something to this quackery, (laughs) you know? And, and so obviously it's been working because as a matter of fact, tomorrow I have to go adjust three police horses tomorrow because they're, they're doing all the coronavirus uh, type distancing downtown and making sure that the parks are right and things like that. So yeah, that's when they come in, they get them adjusted, make sure they're good. Very neat. Do you have a, do you have a preference of, of which you work on the most? You know, I love, I love working on 
on a lot of dogs. And mm-hmm. honestly, you know, if, if there were preference, right? Because that's, it's easy, it's fast, the dog doesn't question the adjustment, uh, and you see the results immediately. When it comes to the human, for example, I'll tell them, now I need you to rest. And <laughs> so their back pain is cured, and they're like, fine, I could go do the gardening I needed to do. Yeah, there it goes. <laughs> so, um, so humans a little bit less. Uh, horses, I love them too. It's just they're bigger animals and it's a lot more um, energy. Now, it doesn't mean that I have to be super strong, but it helps. I do, I do exercise and lift weights just to make sure that I can keep myself healthy for my animals, you know, and for my humans. Um, that's, that's what I love to do. Very cool. I love it. Um, okay. You ready for some rapid fire questions? These weren't on the outline. They're just some random things that um, I think are very fun. Get to get to know you a little bit okay. better. Are you ready? All right. Yes. <laughs> okay. Tell us something about yourself that uh, people don't generally know about you. That I hiked up Mount Kilimanjaro and I made it to the very top, 19,341 feet. Wow. <laughs> that is impressive. <laughs> that is. Made me a little bit of a go-getter. There you go. Yeah. How long ago was that? That was in 2011. Wow. I'm, the, cool. I'm the first Puerto Rican woman to make it to the very top. I, that doesn't surprise me. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't. You're unbelievable. <laughs> uh, what is your favorite breed of dog? My favorite breed of dog. Oh my God. Well, now I have a boar's way. So she's like Aww. the cutest thing ever. So they it used to be cute. Yorkies. I'm, there's heart. That's a, that's a tough one. But right now I have a boar's way and I love her to death. You'll see a whole bunch of pictures of her on, on Facebook. <laughs> okay. They're such a sweet, docile breed. Oh, yes. Um, what has been your most unusual client? I suppose Alina. it involves human as well. <laughs> Yeah, that one, that's, those are special. A lemur, is that what you said? Yes, a lemur. I saved this lemur from having an amputation. I think we think that she was probably hit by a car, and it blew her elbow joint a little bit, and um, she was chewing at her arm, trying to take it off, basically, because, you know, like when your hands go to sleep and it's that nerve-type pain, mm-hmm. where it's like, you know, like when your hands wake up and it sometimes could be ant crawly or it could be painful. Um, she was literally chewing into her arm and biting off her, the tips of her fingers. And after I adjusted her elbow, she stopped it. And she, cool. she was able to keep her. She had one arm amputation. The other one, that I had nothing to do with. The one that she had left, I was able to save. Very cool. Yeah, wow. that's cool. They're adorable. Yes. <laughs> okay, next one. Who do you admire okay. most? Oh, who do I admire most? In terms of anything, mm-hmm. you know, I would have to say Maya Angelou. Oh. I don't know why. That's, that was the first name that came to my mind. Okay, good. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Name one thing on your bucket list. Whoo, one thing on my bucket list. Oh, Bora Bora would be nice. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> that does sound nice right now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> What's the best piece of advice that you've ever received? Oh, the best piece of advice that I've ever received. You always have a no. You're going for the yes. Mm, that's good. Mm-hmm. That, that's good. Yep. And don't let anybody take, take away your thunder. Mm-mm. I'm a go-getter. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I mean, you are. You can imagine, right? An animal chiropractor. Really? Who's ever thought of that <laughs> one? <laughs> It's so cool. Well, yeah. thank you. I love that you shared your enthusiasm with us today and your knowledge. Your your passion is just over the top. And oh, thank you. I really appreciate you um, sharing it with us. Is there, how can listeners find you or, or contact you? Oh, thank you. So I do have a website and it's docjackie.com. That's D-O-C-J-A-C-K-I-E dot okay. com. Mm-hmm. And, or they could go, I'm also on social media. So they could look at Doc Jackie on Facebook or the real Doc Jackie on Instagram. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you so much. Enjoy your beautiful, thank- warm day. Absolutely. And I do travel. I do have um, a mobile practice. 
And okay. it's 713-627-WELL, 9355, 713-627-9355. Okay. And we can contact you there. How can, where can we find your schedule? Is yes. it going to be on your website of where you travel? Yes, there, there is a, a schedule there. Of course, now it's changed because of the coronavirus stuff, but okay. usually I tend to uh, publish it there. And if not, just text me and I'm, I always answer my calls and my email. So mm-hmm. absolutely. And I think people will be surprised um, how much and where you actually do travel. I mean, um, because you're going to different national events so that'll a lot of times take you out of the state of texas that is correct i travel all yeah. over willing to i love what i do and uh, i'm also i do give lectures sometimes we were i was scheduled to talk at a vet tech school here on the 18th but unfortunately again because of this coronavirus it was canceled but i do talk to, for you know if clubs want me to explain what it is that i do or do a demo i'm i love what i do i'm happy to demonstrate very cool Thank you very much, Doc Jackie. I appreciate it. Courtney, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. I'm honored. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Bird Dog Babe podcast. If you enjoyed this episode and learned something from the content, please share it with your friends. Please subscribe, rate, and review this podcast at whichever platform you're listening from. Check out the show notes for links to references from this episode, as well as info on how to connect through Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. If you're loving this podcast and want to support the production and content, please consider becoming one of my Patreon patrons. Being a patron connects us more on a personal level where I'm able to help answer questions and give advice. My husband William and I have bred, owned, and trained AKC Master Hunters, Field Champions, NAVDA VCs, and AKC show champions. We're excited to not only share what we've learned, but also listen from previous and future episode guests for additional content. Go to patreon.com backslash the bird dog babe and $5 per month and you're in. And as always, 2% goes to conservation. Until next week, bird dog babes, keep them versatile.